<laughs> Welcome to the show, Carrie Burke. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to have you. You are a very accomplished woman, and I am just so excited to have you on the show today and show everybody, honestly, how fearless and authentic you are because you really, really are. Thank you. I love the message of your show, so I'm really excited. Thank you. You know, it came to me because for so many years, you know, you're 21 years old. I am, we are 10 days apart, by the way. No way. <laughs> yes. Just many, many more years in between. I'm December 27th. There you go. So that's right before New Year's, right after Christmas. It's a shitty time to be born, um, as my daughters tell me, because <laughs> it's such a busy time, you know, but when I was growing up, my parents made me feel really special and I'm Jewish, so we we always came back with a gift um, because of Hanukkah. So I didn't feel like I got screwed in the in the gifts, but as an adult, it's it's not so easy because your friends are always busy. It's such a weird time to have a birthday. I feel like you can't really host a party because we're both end of December, so everyone's already on their Christmas vacation, holiday vacation, and they've spent all their money. And they've spent all their money and all their <laughs> gifts. So it's just a really weird time to have a birthday. I know. Yours isn't so bad because it's right before, but it is. It's in the rush of the holidays. Every Nobody's in the let's celebrate Carrie. I mean, you know. Right. Everyone's so focused on Christmas. I'm actually not doing my 21st birthday party this year until middle of January. So I'm putting it off a month until everyone else is back from the holidays in order that's to really really smart but it's like not a special because it's not the actual day when I'm turning 21 but it is what it is you know Carrie I feel like I said I'm going to be 63 I still like to celebrate my birthday on the day yep you know Thank because you. It, it doesn't so I get it so happy early birthday Thank you. You 20, too. <laughs> oh, thank you. 21. So I want to start from the beginning of your very, very um, wonderful life. You've had so much success and you're soon to be 21. So back when you were eight years old, you started writing books with your mom. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I actually, I don't talk too much about this anymore since I'm kind of trying to come into my own as a writer, right. but I already, yeah, I mean, it's like a big part of my background. I started writing books when I was eight years old. I had this like wildly successful children's book series with my mom that was super unexpected. My mom is a writer, so I grew up watching her and being inspired by her. So I was really, really grateful for her mentorship growing up. And I really wrote books with her until I was 14 and now I'm 20. So it has taken like kind of my whole life. It's taken up my whole life. And it really was like difficult to branch out of that and kind of come into my own as a writer because I felt like I was always in her shadow, like always the co-writer. Mm. So that's why my current book, my real life rom-com is really special to me because this is my first solo byline. This is the, my first project I'm doing by myself. I came up with the idea by myself, wrote it, edited it, got my agent publisher, everything by myself. So it's really, really special to me. And at the same time, I still have the support of my mom, which I'm super grateful for. Right, right. What a great way to introduce you into the world of writing and using your imagination and to do it with your mom. Just very, very cool. I love doing things with my daughters. It's just a very special time. And um, we are going to get into your book because I love it. Is that your um, purple sweatshirt that you refer to in the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks really, really cute on you. Yes. So one of the things before we get into the book, um, which I want to spend a lot of time talking about, that in the book, you refer to being a social media influencer. So I feel like at a very young age, you were an influencer before you started writing this book. So that's why I want to sort of start there yeah. and tell me, was that the first step? I know the first step was writing the books when you were eight years old, mm -hmm. but what came next? Because you've had, you know, you're an actress and you're a writer um, and you also have, I think I read over 70 million followers among over all of your platforms 
Yeah. So what came next? Mm. Really, I I wrote this fashion blog. It was called Carrie's Chronicles because I always dreamed of being a journalist and nobody would hire like a 16 year old girl to write for big magazines. So I was kind of writing for myself. So I basically just started writing my own website, doing these articles and fashion beauty features. And that kind of got popular because I was messaging celebrities, interviewing lots of celebrities for it. So it was kind of gaining some traction because celebrities were sharing their interviews that I was doing. So that's kind of how I gained a following on Instagram from my blog. And then TikTok came into the picture over the pandemic simply because I was bored at home. I didn't really have much to do. I was just creating videos for fun. And then one night I had this fitness video I made blow up. So that's kind of how it all started. Basically just started creating videos constantly during the pandemic. I was posting four or five times a day, sometimes Mm -hmm. six, just knocking out content like crazy and then before I knew it, I had a million and then two million and then three million. So it kind of just kept growing like crazy. So then I had this social media presence that I loved and I was grateful for, but it wasn't like super fulfilling. I mean, it was great, but at the same time, like I wanted to be writing more. So did it feel a little empty? So I know that you, okay, you wanted to do something more substantial, if I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah, I mean, the fame that comes on social media is fleeting. Like, I don't get nearly as much engagement on my social media as I did during the pandemic. So, yeah, and, I mean, and that's and that is due to everybody being home during the pandemic, or that maybe you just hit it then at the right time, and then everybody's moved on to other things. What do you? Yeah. What do you? I think a combination of both. I think it was easier to gain a following when everyone was at home and on their phones, but also it's just natural. Like influencers gain notoriety and then also fall off. So I, yeah, I feel like I'm not like nearly as like popular as I was during the pandemic. Like obviously I still have a following and I have the engagement, but I knew from the very beginning that social media could like go away at any time. Like we saw during the pandemic, TikTok almost got banned. So I was very like rational from the very beginning. And I wanted to make sure that I had my career on the side and my writing. So I just started, you know, working on rom-com. I don't know if you want to get into it now. I do. I do. I just wanted to know how, you know, how, how the social media um, following started. So you answered that question and before we get into the book again, you do talk about this in your book, but can you just give us a little information about the bullying that you dealt with? Was that during the time that you were growing your followers? Yeah, um, I think it, it's happened a few times. I feel like it's kind of par for course with right. gaining a social media following. I was really lucky that I didn't really get any of it at first. I had like this one situation happen where I was trying to promote a small business and we got into a bit of a disagreement and then I got like a lot of hate online for that. And I was on a reality show in 2022 and I got a lot of hate for that. So there are like different moments when it happens, but I feel like the more that I go through it, the more that I gain a tough skin. Also being in this industry from such a young age, I've gained a tough skin. Like I've literally been in the media industry since I was eight. So if someone sends me a hate message now, I'm like, all right, this is like not the first time. It won't be the last, like everything's going to be fine. It is, it is tough. I mean, I've gotten it myself, but I can't imagine being as young as you are and receiving it and, and building that, that tough skin. And I'm sure it was probably helpful to have the good, the right people around you and your parents. And it's hard. It's not, it's not always easy to go. So thank you for sharing that with me. Okay. Let's get into your book, which I absolutely love. And I want to tell you again, as a much older woman, um, I can relate to almost everything you talked about. And that's, that's what it is about love. Like when we first talked on the phone, I'm like, Hmm, I don't know. And then reading your book, I was just like, this can relate to all ages. So the inspiration for writing your book 
It is called My Life as a, no. My Real Life Rom-Com. Yes, there it is. My Real Life (laughs) Rom-Com. And, but the tagline is, and I have it right over, how to build confidence and write your own relationship rules. And I love, love, love that. So what was your inspiration for writing the book? Okay. So (laughs) uh, yeah, let's get into it. So basically during the pandemic, I I have really bad memory. So I was worried about losing all of my memories related to love and romance and you know, everything surrounding that, the lessons that I learned from it. So I just started writing down everything I could remember. And I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I thought I was just writing personal essays. I was going to submit them to different magazines. And one day I visited, I revisited this personal essay I wrote when I was 16, the day that my ex-boyfriend broke up with me, my first love. And I came back to that essay. Jack. Jack. Jack, yes. All the names are changed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I came back to that essay and I was like, I want to do this, but I want to flesh it out. So I revised that essay. I added more to it. I had the baseline there because this was an essay I wrote literally the day he broke up with me. So the emotions were so raw in it. Like that's why when you read that chapter, like it's so specific like what it felt like when he broke up with me so anyway I have all these essays here and I'm going to submit them to magazines it's not really getting any bites what the places I submitted it at and then I sent them to one of my best friends and she's like blowing up my phone and she said to me no Carrie this isn't an essay this isn't just a series of essays you can put these together and form a book and this can be something really meaningful So what started Mm. off as a form of self-therapy for me, a way Mm. to find closure with my past and come to terms with these shitty situations with guys turned into something so much greater because I realized there were no books out there written by a teenager for teenagers about love. You see the dating guides out there. You see, you know, here are the rules for dating. Here are you know, here's what you should do on your first day. You see all that written by experts, which is great, but nobody really knows it better than an actual like teenager going through it. And there's no better teacher than experience. Like I remember you asked me during our pre-interview, that do you think you're an expert? And I said that I, I don't, but I also don't need to be because like, are any of us really experts? Like we're all growing and learning and making mistakes and what makes this book so special is that I'm not presenting myself as perfect I'm showing myself making mistakes and helping people learn through my experiences and it's it's so it feels so authentic it feels so raw like when you were writing um the the chapter about your first love you know I felt it I like you said I felt all those feelings I know what it feels like so love is love it doesn't really change and I want to talk to you about Golden Bachelor too, oh, yeah. uh, because I, I saw that you're a fan and I have another podcast about that. So um, <laughs> it's um, I'm obsessed with love and relationships, mostly relationships and why they work and why they don't work. So um, I just really, everybody listening, you've got to go out and buy the book, whether you are 20 or 60 or older, it's something that you can relate to. And it's so well-written and it's, I love the lessons at the end also. Because that's you, ref- if you know, if I understand this correctly, that's you reflecting and then giving your advice, which is what you're talking about. And you're right; you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to have. I thought about that conversation all day after I asked you that, and I thought, you know, am I, am I an expert on aging? No, be, but I'm living it, and I'm I'm sharing the journey to help other people step into that same journey of aging the way you want to age. So just the same way you told me on the phone. Are, it's like, are any of us ever really experts? Cause we all make mistakes. I feel like what makes us, what makes this book so special, you know, is that I'm not presenting myself as an expert or like marketing myself as a dating expert. I'm not right. saying here are your rules for dating. Here's what you need to do. I'm not telling you how you should date, who you should date. This is just authentically me. I'm presenting my experiences and letting people take what they will from that. 
And I feel like that last chapter, why that resonated with you so much is that that was just authentically me. Like this book is not bashing guys. It's not like this feminist manifesto. Like it's, it's just not that, like that last chapter, I just really returned to center. Each of the chapters is about a different guy. It's dedicated to a different guy, a different dating experience. But that last chapter is dedicated to me and what I went through in my anxiety journey and how that, what that taught me about love and that, you know, the importance of loving yourself and learning how to love yourself at your lowest points before loving other people. Like that was that one chapter, that was literally a personal essay that I had so just in the archives, like I didn't want to publish that ever. And I was thinking about how I wanted to end my book. And I was kind of going through things that I'd written in the past and I saw it and I was terrified because it's really, really vulnerable. And it's sharing like my like innermost self with the world. But at the same time, like there aren't enough people and there aren't enough people talking about anxiety and OCD in like such an authentic manner. So it was really important to do. No. And again, it, it just goes with the rest of the book, the way you write, it comes from your heart. It comes from your gut. It comes straight out. Uh, it's raw. It's, and that's how I felt the whole book was. It wasn't not raw, like in a depressing way, in a, just a very, very honest way. And again, I love the comments at the end where you give tips because mm -hmm. I was thinking like all the young girls that are going to read this book, they need to hear this stuff. They really, really yeah. do. And what better to hear from somebody who's gone through it. So the first chapter you talk about, um, if we can go through some of the chapters. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. I would love to do that. Not so many spoilers, but let's do it. Okay. <laughs> you can be responsible for no spoilers. I will okay. be very good about that. Okay. Uh, the ba bar mitzvah, the b'nai mitzvah time in your life when you're 13. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that experience for you and the kissing and, you know, what you learned from that time in your life. Oh, yeah. I mean, I grew up very fast growing up. It sounded that way. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of just normal with the bar bar mitzvah scene running around New York City, going to these parties every weekend at age 12, 13. So I feel like hookup culture started from a really young age. Like when I was 12, everyone was like making out at parties and I needed, I felt like I needed to catch up. So in that chapter, you really see me like kind of fighting with that, like saying, you know, am I forcing myself to grow up too soon? Is this really what I want to do? This kind of feels stupid and meaningless. Do I really want my first makeout to be with someone I don't care about? And just fighting with those concepts for the first time. Did you feel like you were a little bit, I know you said you grew up fast, but did you feel like you were a late bloomer in that? Because when I heard you, you know, you were saying that um, you were getting to, into Ubers at 12 years old and so on. I was like, oh my God, I can't imagine ever like letting my daughters at that age, but we lived in suburbia, not in the city. So it is, it's a different, different way to grow up. Yeah, my but best you... friend was scared to take Ubers up until last year, and she's currently 19. So there you go. There yeah. you go. <laughs> and she um, covers. So, um, so did you feel like you had to catch up because you felt like you were lagging behind? You're like, okay, what do I need to do to catch up to everybody? Crazy enough, I think I was. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was lagging behind, and I was only 12. Like, I had to give myself, I had to cut myself some slack. But at the time, like, everyone was just making out with everyone everyone was going to parties uh having like my mom drop me off at a bat mitzvah was like unheard of like everyone used to go together in ubers by themselves and then like my mommy was dropping me off so it was like embarrassing for me so yeah I felt like a, a late bloomer I'm also like an only child so I've kind of had to fight with that all my life right um but yeah, I, I think I, I did a nice job of like forcing myself to grow up. I probably gave my my mom a little bit of a heart attack along the way. Yes. She is dangerous, but yes. she also did a great job kind of letting me go slowly, like walk to school alone with a friend at mm -hmm. first. And I I really did not take the subway up until 
last year. So <laughs> that's crazy enough. My 30 year old daughter lives in the city and she's been there since 2015. And I still don't like her taking the subway. Yeah, I have a fight about it with my mom at least once a week. It's mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> I mean, we're in New York City. I feel like I reached a point where I was just like, you know, this is this is public transportation. Like you're living in New York City. Right. How you get to places easy. So I kind of just shifted. But it's like crazy. There's so many things in the city that just like force you to grow up so soon. Right. And as a teenager, that can be scary. So I'm hoping to make that a little bit easier for people and make teenagers feel like they're heard by what what, when you were writing this first chapter what were your thoughts in trying to convey to the reader what what was your biggest point that you wanted to make or several points so this was this chapter was tough because this is very far removed and like I said I have really bad memory So I really had to dig down deep here and remember being 13. Most of the other chapters, 16, 18, kind of closer to age. When I was writing it, the main thing that I remembered was just that feeling of intense desperation and just like needing a guy to feel good about myself, needing a guy to feel like I fit in at school. At 12. At 12, yeah. I mentioned in the book I was... I had written my cupcake books at the time, my children's Mm -hmm. books with my mom. And I was known at school as like the cupcake girl and people would kind of make like those insults, like backhand insult. I don't know. They would like insult me like without insulting me. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. So I felt like I had something to prove and I wanted to like prove myself as mature. So the main thing that I want to get across to teenagers is that you have nothing to prove. There's no reason to feel desperate at age 12. At age 12, you should be finding yourself. You don't need to be finding a guy yet. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. (laughs) I admire my neighbor. My neighbor is around that age. And I mention like bar and bat mitzvahs to her. I'm like, are there any guys there? And she's like, yeah, but you know, no. Like I'm I'm going and I'm having fun with my friends. And that is so refreshing to hear. I know, right? Like that makes me have hope for that generation because when my generation was going through that, everyone was in those like slutty, like black dresses. Like, I I don't know if that's still a thing. It probably is. I don't know either. My, my daughters are way past that. They're like I said, 30 and 34. But I, when I was, when I was listening to it, I thought, were my daughters doing that? Were they looking for the boy? Were they trying to hook up? I mean, I, I, I haven't had time to ask them, but they're probably going to be like, yeah, mom. Yeah. You were always looking for the hot guy. You're always looking for the cute guy. Yep. It was a really crazy culture and it was so scary. Like I would, if I had no one to talk to for like a spare second at the party, I would go into panic mode. I'm like, oh my God, who do I talk to? Like, right. And then I would just like run into the bathroom like five times and just like pop my gum in like anxiously. Just well, like, can I tell you, I do that too when I'm at parties and I don't have yeah. anybody to talk to or I feel anxious or I'm like, I, I don't want to be here or, it's you know, so now. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, not that I can relate to that, that particular setting, going back to the point where it was such an interesting time. I mean, it's, you, you see kids just exploring so much at that age and as parents of children that age, and I can relate to what your mom went through that you you think that they're still staying very young, but in the meantime, they're really exploring and you see your daughter leaving to go to one of these parties and you're like, oh, wait, no, she's she's growing up. And uh, but- and it's a it's a gradual thing. I'm, I'm moving out of the apartment for the first time, actually, like wow. today, signing the lease. So congratulations. Thank you. But it's like it's a gradual process. I feel like adulting and how difficult adulting is is so underrated and it starts as early as age 12 so I mean it's like a a few a multi-step process and in this book you see like a lot of those steps you see it when I'm 12 at the bat mitzvahs you see it when I'm 16 going through my first heartbreak you see it when I'm 18 when I'm having my first panic attack while simultaneously trying to find love and give love to others there's so right. many important step stones that happen during these years and there are no 
there are no people really out there like providing authentic accounts for what that's like. So my goal with this book was just to give teenagers a tool that doesn't feel like they're being told what to do, but makes them feel like they can relate to something and make them feel heard in such just such a weird time in their lives. It is a weird time and they might not want to ask their friends, right? They might feel embarrassed because they assume that their friends have done this or they don't want to feel like they are behind. So we go to the next chapter, um, which is, um, I didn't love. write it down. I the just wrote love. your first love. I have it over here. Your first love. And I'm, you mentioned a few things, trusting your hardships, giving yourself grace. So what, give us a little bit about, I know that was a big big chapter, but tell us a little bit about that chapter and what you want people to take away from it. I think just first love and your first heartbreak is hard. You see it romanticized a lot in the movies. I, I say this in my chapter, everyone just thinks it can be cured by like eating ice cream in bed for a few days. Like that's kind of the norm that you see in the movies, but you don't see representations of what it's really like to get your heart broken it can feel like grief it's extremely earth shattering so what I wanted to depict was what that moment felt like for me most importantly I read and reread and edited and re-edited that one moment where my ex's mom broke up with me <laughs> by texting my mom it's I know, couldn't six, believe that 16 year old things it happens yeah but that moment was so earth shattering because it was the first time I really allowed myself to love someone. And then in like a second, that was mm -hmm. just the rug was ripped out from under me and I was a completely blindsided. So I describe what that was like for me, not just, you know, it was hard and I ran home and I cried, but no, like what, what was it really like when I found out I, literally ran down the streets my surroundings were blurry I dropped to the floor I like couldn't see anything I started to panic in retrospect it was probably my first panic attack back then right. but a lot was happening that moment so I wanted to describe what heartbreak feels like in your fingers and your toes and you know all those complicated emotions and what happens when those emotions resurface years later when you see a picture of the guy like so many of these things that we just we talk about and we throw around but we don't really talk about in a raw manner like this but that's why this chapter was so important for me i think first loves the concept of having a first love is so significant and i wanted to portray it as authentically as possible you did you did i mean i i felt every single feeling and what is your um advice to other 16 year old girls or 15 year old girls who find themselves really feeling like they have fallen in love with somebody at that point. So advice for when they're broken up with the person. Yes. Yes. I think you said it. I think feeling all the feelings is so important. Like we often push our feelings down and say, you know, F this guy, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. And maybe at some point, like it's, obviously great to move forward and have fun and you know, rebounds are a thing but first you need to look within and process your emotions because if you push them down they're only just going to come back later and you need to give yourself the time and the patience to reflect on those emotions to go through the stages of grief and also just show yourself some grace if a year later, it's still really hard. It doesn't, there's no like timeline for this. It can be a year later and you're doing well. And then all of a sudden something makes you think of the person and you're a mess for a few days. It happens. It's just life. So I just say like ride, ride the waves of like those emotions and allow yourself like some patience and grace. And feel those feelings. And feel all the feelings. It's so hard to feel all the feelings. And I think so many young girls, you know, find another boy or find another distraction. You talk about the distractions too. Yeah. And I think it's okay to find yourself doing something that's healthy for your mind and body, um, as long as it doesn't become all consuming. 
So a lot of girls might get really, and I know you love fitness. I've been in fitness for over 40 years. So I, we share that love of what, how wonderful it is for our mind and body. But when you take it um, to a certain degree where it's obsessive, then it becomes unhealthy. Um, so I think if you have somebody to help you balance that, um, I know just a knee jerk reaction. I know from my, my loves, my, my dating life, it's just, you have friends that say, well, just, just get back out there and, you know, you'll find somebody and just, then you'll forget about this one, but it's, that never works. Exactly what you say. When you push it down, it's always going to come back up at any age. Pushing it down also just gives it more significance. It's showing you that this is something that needs to be avoided. It's teaching your brain a poor lesson. You need to face it and accept it and have a talk with yourself because the less scared you are of it, the better you'll be able to handle it. By pushing it down, you're reinforcing its significance inside of your brain. So let's jump over to The Golden Bachelor for a minute because I know you're a fan. And like I said, I'm do, I do a recap podcast about The Golden mm -hmm. Bachelor and so you see, you're talking, you're 20 years old, you you're, wrote this book about your younger dating time and love and romance and vulnerability. And then you see these women over 60 who are going through the same things that like you went through. Did that surprise you to see older women going through a lot of the same feelings you might've felt that you wrote about in your book? I mean, it didn't surprise me. I feel like at any age, these themes are prevalent. I think the difference, though, is that as a teenager, you're probably going through these things for the first time, whereas these women on Golden Bachelor have probably gone through this multiple times in their lives. Mm, right. And it's so beautiful to watch because each woman has such like a level of maturity to them, with the exception of like a few, but that's probably just like producer driven drama because they need right. something. Right. Like, these are genuinely like nice women that support each other and lift each other up and have lived life. So yeah, I'm, I, I love it. Cause it's just watching like a, such a mature, like an emotionally mature journey to love. And it's a good model, I think for the younger bachelor too, just to see how it's done. Let the right. older people take the wheel. I agree. I agree. Um, now we go on to chapter three, the vampire. Can you touch upon that one? That was a very interesting chapter. Yeah. So vampire without giving away too much, exactly what it sounds like. Some guy with a weird fetish, he liked to bite and he just like kept coming back. And, and you were like, what, 18 at the time? I wasn't sure. I was like 17. Oh, no, 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 wait. No, I was six. I think I was six. No, I was 17. Okay. So that's so weird. Yeah. It was just really weird. Um, also like a theme throughout this book, I'm, I'm on like a lot of social media tours. So I keep falling for like this same social media boy over and over again. And all of them are weird. I'm not, I don't want to make a generalization. No, it's okay. Like, <laughs> you're like, making you're making a general statement okay so most of them are weird but most of them are weird most of them are very full of themselves and mm. I found that out over time that that was a pattern wow so yeah I mean like most of these guys kind of just focus their lives on social media are not very career driven and like that's all they have going for them they just like post thirst traps online and monetize off of that Okay. And it's just like so fleeting, but it's like the same type of guy over and over again that I just kept going for. What is the social media tour you're on? If you want to plug that. Oh, I'm reason. not on it anymore. Okay. Okay. I'm not on it anymore. Yeah. I I did like a few pop-up tours here and there mm -hmm. when I was first blowing up on TikTok. Okay. That's where I met my ex, my first love. We met on a social media tour. Okay. I explained a little bit what it is in that chapter, but it's basically like a bunch of influencers coming together to put on a show and to meet fans. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if you were still doing that. No. no. Okay. Okay. Those days, <laughs> those days are gone. Yeah. Those days are gone. That okay. was pretty college. Okay. Um, and also that must've made you grow up really fast too. You're touring yeah. and did your mom come with you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. But that was also interesting. Um, it was exciting, I think, for a long time, but it got it got 
annoying when I just started to see the same patterns over and over and over again. Like I was just having like the same situation, like catching feelings for some guy who's a social media influencer, it being great for a few days and then the tour ending and then nothing ever happening. So just like that's frustrating. A hint of something only to have my heart broken like days later. Do you feel like you fall fast? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's a feeling I I got. Yeah. Um, all the time. Like I'll I'll meet someone and after a day, I'll be like in the book, I'll like meet someone and I'll after a day, I'll just say to myself, like, oh my God, like this could be the one. Like I could picture myself with this person. Right. So that yeah, that was a long, a long process. But don't you think you had to go through it? to talk about it now. I mean, we wouldn't have this wonderful book if you had not gone through these things. For sure. I mean, I always say I'm, I'm in a relationship now. I got into my new relationship a month yeah. after I, I know, thank God. <laughs> I got into a relationship a month after I turned in the manuscript for this book. Wow. So it was really almost divine. We've been dating yes. almost seven months. So it's been, it's been really great. I mean, it's my longest relationship yet. And I feel like all of these experiences I've gone through in the book have taught me so much about love and just given me this level of emotional maturity that I feel like I can contribute to a relationship. Right. Whereas like the carry in this book was just desperate and looking for love and like falling really hard without considering who this person really is well you were you were young you were looking for you weren't necessarily looking for the love within yourself you were looking for validation from other people and I think so many if we just focus on girls here um so many girls do do that they look for a boy a man even adult women do that they feel crappy about themselves if a man can make them feel better, but again, that's fleeting. It's not long lasting and you can't put out that right, that good, solid, confident energy without loving yourself first. Absolutely. I think my definition of love has definitely shifted since finishing the book, since Mm -hmm. getting into a new relationship. In retrospect, like I look back at that first love and I question if that was really love. I think that was just an infatuation at the time probably Um, yeah so I think what it really means to love someone is to like love is in my opinion when two independent souls come together and then they like shine brighter together like love is not being codependent on each other and spending every waking moment together love is letting letting each other be independent and supporting individual pursuits and then you come together and you're even stronger together that's what I've learned that you're a team you're a team that's looking out for one another and you right you're stronger together than you are apart and it's a beautiful thing if that if that can work for you exactly I think so many of these relationships in the book or attempted relationships it was just like codependency like right this person wanted wanted me because he was horny and I wanted this person because I was feeling down and desperate. So that's, that's not how right down, desperate, sad, alone, whatever the feelings were. And I think so many women you talk about at the beginning of the book. Also um, your name is Carrie yeah. and I know it's your full name isn't Carrie, but that you're how much you looked up to Carrie Bradshaw from sex in the city. And um, I thought that was so cute. I love the name Carrie too. I think it's so cute. <laughs> Well, my real name is Caroline, right. but nobody ever calls me Caroline unless I'm in trouble. You were Carrie from day one, right? Of Even course. though on your birth certificate, it's Caroline. Yes. Nobody ever calls me Caroline. It's my my mom calls me Caroline when I'm like upset. When she, yeah, when she's upset with me and yeah. my boyfriend will call me Caroline like as a joke sometimes. But yeah, no, you look, you look like a Carrie. So Thank you. you look like a Carrie. Um, So the next chapter, because I want to continue to go to these, um, the Aristotle attic, this one made me laugh. I'll try to make them quicker without giving them so much away. Yeah, go ahead. Aristotle attic. uh, Yeah, just like total asshole. Um, Basically, the whole notion of it is this guy was obsessed with Aristotle and like philosophy. But when it came to girls, he was anything but wise. So like the irony there. Right, right. Okay. 
Um, then we go on to um, going to a guy's house. No, that's not the name of it. I was, <laughs> these are my notes. The that pandemic was- fling, the pandemic was- fling. Because you were, you were yeah. talking about the advice you were giving at the end of that chapter. I took notes on every chapter, by the way. Uh, uh, such a good student. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, the um, pandemic uh, fling. Pandemic fling. It was the middle of the pandemic. Sad, lonely, depressed. What does Carrie do? I see a guy staying next door. I thought it was like a gift from God. I hadn't seen a man in like a year. <laughs> and I go for it. And turns out the guy it has, or the guy's, sorry, the guy's parents have COVID. Right. And at the time, we didn't know like how it worked with like transferring it. And, like, right. Like, carrier. So my family freaked out. And mm-hmm. it happened. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think we all had one of those. Okay. Yeah. The surfer's the surfer soulmate you gave two chapters to. I know he was important. Yeah. So can you tell us why he was important without giving off too much and either your advice or how you want the reader to feel after reading that chapter in particular? Okay. So surfer soulmate, I divided into two chapters because I felt like that experience I had two different themes I wanted to explore. The first chapter was the notion of FaceTime dating and getting to know someone over FaceTime and feeling like you really know who they are. So So valuable. Yeah. This guy I talked to for eight months and we never met in person yet. So that was crazy. And then when we finally met in person, he lived in California. So we were in the same state. We finally met in person and that chapter is about sex. And like a first time, like potential first time and leading up to it, like the pressure, like the confusion, like, should I do this? Should I not do this? Should I wait till I'm in a relationship? Should I not wait until I'm in a relationship? Like so many conflicting emotions surrounding Mm. that. And then also what happens if it doesn't go according to plan and the emotions surrounding that. And the plan being having a relationship after you have sex? I mean, the, in this chapter, it's a, the plan first being having sex and it not happening. Right. And then after that, having a relationship, having just even staying, I don't want to give it away. Okay, okay. What happens is the, the sex doesn't happen and right. a lot, there's a lot of emotions that happen after and I basically like never hear from this guy again. Yeah, that was a big one. That was a really, really big one. Um, The next chapter is the best friend's ex. Yeah, exactly what it sounds like. Stupid. Juicy. Stupid, stupid, and very juicy. Um, So your recommendation for, what's your advice at the end of this chapter? Can we give that? Yeah, don't do it. Good girl. Okay. Yeah. Right. I was really happy to hear you say that. I I didn't think it would be otherwise. Um, Next is the big shot. Yes. Uh, He was 27. I was 18. So that that one's all about like a huge age gap and me having just turned 18. Like I was newly not a minor. So (laughs) right. I also have a huge fight with my mom in that chapter. Right. Fun one to read. No, it's a good one. Um, the next one is the shy guy. I really liked this chapter a lot. What did you take away from that relationship? Um, yeah, I feel like this guy was like very shy. I was just, I had to like give more than he was giving to the, the connection. It wasn't even a relationship, but I knew him for like two days. Um, but it was interesting because this guy was very shy, but in the end he like brought out a very assertive side to me. And I don't know, he's kind of like an ass in the end. Yeah. But as a result, I was able to be very clear about like the relationship I wanted and the fact he wasn't going to give me that. So I stood up to him. And that's what a shy guy gave me. He gave me confidence. I loved what you took away from that. I loved it. And the biggest the biggest takeaway um, is what you're saying. I'm repeating it, but it's like, don't settle. Don't settle for something there's a passage in that chapter. Oh my God, let me see if I can find it. And you say something like, don't settle for someone who's not Very giving good. you what you need. There's and a, I, I've, I've experienced that. Oh, for sure. I mean, I got it. Okay. Okay. Dramatic reading. Yes. 
don't settle for someone just because you like the feeling of his skin pressed against yours. Seek someone who truly sees you. Someone who refills your glass every time it's empty. Someone who makes you laugh until your stomach hurts. Someone who wipes away your tears when you don't have the strength to. Someone who loves you unconditionally, without question or hesitation. Someone who feels like home. It may take time, but when you find that person, it will have been worth the wait. Beautiful. One of my favorite my favorite things I put in the book. It's just so important. I, it really resonated very strongly with me. Yeah, I thought that was wonderful. Um, the next chapter is the showman's turned no man's. Yeah, I was on a reality show. I'm never doing it again. <laughs> Karina, what is that that you played Karina on? No, oh, so this what, was a different one. I tried finding it. Yeah, I don't post it a lot. <laughs> what is it? I didn't. I couldn't find it anywhere. So um, it was this reality show I was on. It's basically about me and a bunch of influencers in a content house together for a week. I don't know how much they say it is on the show. It was can you two- tell me the name of the show or are you rather not? Uh, you can find it online. No. All right, fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Online. Yeah. Um, it was just like a shitty experience. I don't really feel like giving them the publicity. That's <laughs> fine. Fine. But Yeah. I talk about it in the book. It was so important to me to like talk about like what goes on behind the scenes in reality TV. I try not to trash the show as much. Like I can do that all day long, but I I won't. So I focus more on the guy that I was going after in the show Mm -hmm. and what happened and why it hurt so bad. There was a prom on the show and it, really turned wrong and I didn't have a high school prom so that really hurt uh, this is uh, yeah I felt that one it just don't go on reality tv (laughs) okay (laughs) and I mean that's all there is on tv these days right it's like almost all reality tv um not fun to do the dating app disasters so all dating app experiences a lot of these that I explain are some of my first ones how weird they were and unexpected you can find some total weirdos on dating apps Mm -hmm. so this one is probably the most dating guide out of the most chapters like there's the most I have like service boxes throughout my book I have more service boxes in this chapter Mm -hmm. because there are so many things that you need to point out to watch out for on dating apps right because everyone is so phony Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a fun little chapter. And then the next one is the next one is the workaholic. Yeah. The workaholic going into depth about one of those guys I met on the dating apps. Mm -hmm. And basically he was obsessed with his job, like would always abandon our date to like go back to work. Um, just like super into his job and would never give any attention to our relationship. So what would you, what advice would you give everybody? Um, who's dating a workaholic do you stand stay away how do you how do you deal with that life is all about balance I think that's something I personally have learned as someone who's been very career driven from a young age I've been able to balance my career and my personal life I think really well I think expressing your concern first and foremost to the other person is really important seeing if they'll make a shift telling them you know I I know you value your work I value your work too I think it's really important that you focus on your career and your individual pursuits I would just maybe appreciate you make more time for me or let me know if you have to dash off to a work engagement ahead of time before our date and see if he makes a change like it's all about communication it is it is if it doesn't happen then you you reassess but you want someone who who make the time for you make I mean work is important it's absolutely important it gives a lot of people uh definition to who they are but uh if you want to be in a relationship then you need to make the time for it and if you don't have the time then step out of the relationship and say not right now and it is it comes yeah. down to using your words and explaining that so the person doesn't feel like they're not being seen or heard yeah exactly but it's not a total you know, deal breaker. If someone's just like working really hard, maybe they just got a new job. Maybe it's a really like tough crunch time at work. Sure. You just express express that to them and communicate your emotions. And it's all about how they react and adapt. And then you reassess. Good advice. And the last chapter, the journey to self-love. 
and your struggle with anxiety. We talked about it a little bit, but what would you like the listeners to take away from that chapter and your readers? Mm. You hear everywhere, you can't love others until you love yourself. But I really go into depth about what it means to love yourself. I think writing this book, I titled it my real life rom-com because it was a good way to describe you know, the romance in the book and also like, the funny, crazy moments. But your real life rom-com starts with you. It starts with loving it yourself. And that was kind of the conclusion that I wanted readers to reach at the end of the book. Like it all starts with you. It all starts with looking in the mirror when you're at your lowest points and saying, I'm not okay right now. I feel terrible, but I'm going to be okay. And I still love myself right now. And that's when you're able to reach that level of confidence, then that's when you're able to love others. And it's not linear. It's not going to be perfect. I don't, there's some days where I don't do that very well, but as long as you stay grounded and realize everything's going to be okay, as long as you like keep this strong sense of self and are able to focus on things you love and are passionate about, then that's how you're going to foster this strong relationship. And you're going to bring this level of emotional maturity to a relationship. It always starts with you. Always. You have to look at yourself in the mirror and know that it starts with you. I have one more question for you, um, which is, what does it mean to you to be fearlessly authentic? Hmm. I think just to present the most real vulnerable version of yourself for me that's not always easy but I think it's important like I've always wanted to make a difference since I was young and I want to empower people so maybe that's what it is to be fearlessly authentic to be show up as the most real version of yourself and that realize that that's not necessarily always perfect, but have this goal in the back of your mind and like a greater mission of like wanting to empower others. You can hear it in your voice, how much you feel about that. Thank you so much for that answer and for going through your book, Carrie Burke, show everybody your book. Right here. There we go. <laughs> My real life rom-com. And you, everybody listening, you have to go out and get this book, read it yourself. Um, it is a great read. It's an easy read. It's a fun read and you will feel all the feelings. How can we get the book? How can we get, follow you? Give us yeah. all the deets. So you can order my real life rom-com on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, basically anywhere you can get a book, Target, Walmart, and you can follow me on all social media at Carrie Burke. Perfect. Well, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. And thank you so much for being on Fearlessly Authentic. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.